bringing up the end of this distinguished panel and talk about uh, the background to some of the religious motivations of uh, members of the what, what is now called the Citizens for Constitutional Freedom. Uh, I'm going to speak to some of the sort of background worldviews that have at least been attributed to or ascribed to or but to the to the militia or the Citizens for Constitutional Freedom or they proclaimed themselves. Uh, in the first couple of days following the, um, following the occupation, you start to see headlines. This one comes from the Boston Globe of, of January, January uh, 5th uh, and said, Oregon standoff rooted in Mormon fanaticism. Uh, Ammon Bundy has been referred to by, uh, by Slate, very popular online uh, of site um, as the Mormon warrior. Uh, a person by the name of Robert L. Meyer, who somehow I'm on his email distribution list over the last month, uh, has repeatedly each week he sends out an email update on what's going on and has referred many times to the Mormon Malheur Marauders and has successfully linked, or at least in his mind, linked uh, this particular group with uh, Muslims and with uh, uh, the Rajneesis and all of those as domestic terrorists, um, which is a really interesting kind of uh, way to sort of set up the argument. Um, and then uh, f uh, from, from BuzzFeed, uh, a claim that in order to really understand what's going on in the Oregon standoff, you need to understand Mormonism. You need to understand Mormonism to understand the, the standoff. So those are some of the headlines that have sort of permeated some of the public discourse. I think they've sort of faded somewhat over the last couple of weeks, but I just want to uh, go into those a little bit of what actually is happening. Is there, as some have suggested or intimated, uh, such as the Boston Globe article or uh, the Elmire report, is there some kind of Mormon conspiracy going on here or something that's affiliated with sort of the Tea Party movement or something like that? Um, the LDS uh, church in Salt Lake City was very quick to disassociate and distance itself from uh, anything that Ammon Bundy uh, or Ryan Bundy or the rest of the uh, militia group uh, was engaged in. Uh, again, this comes, out, this comes out exceptionally fast for this particular ecclesiastical body. But uh, some two days after uh, church leaders struck, this is just a, a part of, the, of this statement, but church leaders strongly condemn the armed seizure of the facility and are deeply troubled by the reports that those who have seized the facility suggest they are doing so on scriptural principles. Uh, this armed occupation can in no way be justified on a, on a scriptural basis. Um, and yet there are appeals by the militia leaders, by Ammon Bundy in particular, or his brother uh, Ryan Bundy, the Bundy family in, in general, as well as some other unidentified uh, members that do in fact appeal to uh, various kinds of scriptural themes, scriptural narratives, and, and the like. So I just want to, in the few minutes that I have, just unpack those uh, uh, very briefly. I'm not trying to make a judgment one way or the other on, on this particular claim. Um, so uh, a couple of very basic points about LDS teaching. One is about concepts of the land. Uh, the land in general is very, very sacred in LDS teaching. Not, not simply uh, the wildlife refuge, but the land in, in general, and this particular land that is the land of the Americas, both the uh, northern and southern hemispheres of, of the western hemisphere. Um, is said to be a land of promise, that God has given this land to people with various kinds of blessings, blessings of social peace and blessings of material abundance, um, if they will keep their sort of covenant with, uh, with the Creator. So that's, uh, there's a lot at stake within the LDS tradition in general about the significance of, of the land. Um, the second point is just to say that, uh, and this was sort of goes back to some of Steve's comments, that within the LDS tradition, in LDS scripture, the, divine, uh, the U.S. Constitution is understood as a divinely ordained and inspired uh, document uh, with its primary purpose to protect 
uh, individual rights and expression expression of freedom. It's fair to, it's certainly right to point out, as many people have, that the LDS tradition has had a very mixed history with the U.S. government and a particularly a very turbulent 70 years between 1830 and early part of the uh, 20th century. Very turbulent, a lot of uh, persecution back and forth uh, between the, uh, the federal government and various kinds of state governments and the LDS church. But really in the last century or so, um, the church has tried to cultivate a sensibility of citizenship, uh, not only in, in the U.S., but since uh, most Mormons live overseas, uh, that is, they live outside the domains of the United States now, um, and just a sense of respect, honor, and sustaining the laws of the land. And that's in the, one of the credo statements of the LDS tradition. Um, but uh, the question about uh, the Constitution and its, its significance uh, should, should loom very, very large. And I really appreciate that um, Steve has gone over that in some detail. Um, okay, uh, this, uh, what about some possible points of connection, some points of inspiration that these, the militia claims to be gleaning from LDS teachings or Mormon teachings and so forth, or the Mormon historical narrative. Um, well, uh, Ammon Buddy, um, and I'm using that pronunciation Ammon because that's how it's that's how that term is pronounced in the LDS community. Um, it might be pronounced differently otherwise. But uh, he, he claimed in a video that was posted on uh, January 1st that he became interested in the plight of the Hammonds <coughs> after uh, seeking out. God or seeking out uh, the Lord in prayer. And he got uh, what he called an overwhelming urge to come to their assistance, which uh, 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 Steve and Hannah have, have discussed. Um, and there was a divine judgment to be rendered here. The Lord, according to Ammon Bundy, was not pleased with what had happened to the, to the Hammonds. Um, uh, now, uh, in one sense, his methodology, seeking out divine direction in prayer, is very common with in LDS culture. The content of that uh, <coughs> pronouncement or that enunciation, uh, well, that's always a problem within the context of human beings that are fallible and, and finite. Um, uh, uh, Bundy would be considered in, in LDS culture generally to have steps outside his particular calling or his stewardship in making such, such a, a, a pronouncement. But anyway, that's at least part of, of, of why, why we're, we're here, at least part of his uh, motivation. A second point that has been raised very frequently in the views of commentators, and, and again, is certainly present in website postings and the like, um, is drawing on various scriptural themes that are sort of unique to the Mormon community. Um, the Book of Mormon in particular, which is one of the four texts that Mormons hold sacred. Um, so Olive Bundy, who is Ammon Bundy's mother, uh, spouse of uh, Cle uh, Cleveland Bundy, um, um, uh, Hannah referred to just briefly, um, wrote in a November 17 email that uh, the injustices, again, this is all connected to the Hammonds, the injustices the Hammonds are suffering will be a type and a shadow of the suffering the American people will endure if we do not stand up and put an end to it. That language of type and shadow, there's only one place that comes from, and that comes from a narrative of a, of a prof prophetic leader in the, in the sacred scripture for Mormons, the Book of Mormon, who is a, uh, testifying about the judgments of God that will come upon an oppressive, an oppressive king. Now it turns out that this, uh, if you take the full narrative, that particular pro prophet was, didn't take up arms or didn't seek to occupy land, but actually was martyred. So if you play out the full narrative, I think the rationale seems to implode a little bit. But nonetheless, that's uh, sort of circumstance, uh, an attempt to emulate that particular kind of circumstance that has shown up in the discourse. A um, couple of other uh, brief examples. Uh, uh, Ammon, where does that term come from? Well, there is an Ammon in the Bible, but Ammon Bundy is named after 
a leader and the, a character in the, the scripture of the Book of Mormon um, named, named Ammon, that's the only name that uh, he receives. Uh, and this particular individual, this particular Ammon, used armed force to resist the theft of water resources and theft of animals, grazing animals, as it turns out, they were sheep, uh, in, the, in this particular narrative. He was doing that in the service of a king. That is, he did recognize some legitimacy of, of government uh, in that context. So, uh, so anyway, that's kind of Ammon's, Ammon Bundy's namesake is this individual, and you know, per, is he ex trying to enact his own Ammon narrative? It turns out that again, if you play this narrative all the way out, uh, there are pe people that are named after this figure, Ammon, and they become pacifists. They're called the people of Ammon. They are the only people in this entire sacred record who uh, forswear violence or the use of armed force. Um, of when uh, the occupiers, the militia first occupied uh, the Mount Hur refuge, one of them introduced themselves to uh, OPB as, I'm Captain Moroni from Utah. Um, this is sort of an image of, of Captain Moroni within the Latter-day Saint uh, Google library. Um, Cap Captain Moroni is a very significant player in the LDS scripture. Um, and he's a person that comes in the middle of sort of an insurrection, uh, a civil war, if you will, between what are called the free men and the king man. He raises what's called the title of liberty. Uh, again, this is very much on target with what uh, the militia has, has suggested they've been doing. Uh, this title of liberty contained the words, the memory of our God, our religion, our, pe our freedom, our peace, and, and families. Um, and he rallies his uh, these people to the cause of the free men. Uh, um, so uh, again, that's in some sense are the, do the militia, or at least the one individual that identified himself as Captain Moroni, is he enacting out uh, a, particular, a, a particular narrative? Um, the, the difficulty, or the scriptural narrative, uh, again, if you follow the narrative all the way out to its end, Captain Moroni asks not for government to leave, he asks for more help from the government to support the free man. So uh, again, very interesting selective use of sort of a scriptural narrative. The last sort of point, and this will go back to the LDS tradition's understanding of the Constitution as a divinely inspired document, is sort of the basic constitutional appeal. Uh, in a Facebook post on December 26th, Emin Bundy wrote, our rights are being stripped from us, good men are going to prison, uh, so wicked men can gain power and control. That is language taken right out of the Book of Mormon, and right out of another LDS scripture, the Doctrine and Covenants. The Constitution is being grossly violated. Our actions will be recorded in history. The truth always reveals itself. Okay, so there's kind of an appeal to the birth of history, ultimately. Um, uh, once you align yourself with good, with truth, with uh, the Constitution, with God, the Lord revealed this to me, it's very hard to back away from that. Okay, it's very hard to negotiate on behalf of God. Okay, it's just, just hard to do that. So, uh, so uh, in conclusion, a couple of points, geez, uh, two, two points to make. Uh, for those of you that are concerned about a conspiracy being fomented by uh, the official LDS religion. I don't think that's happening. Um, that's, there may be some sort of conspiracy, conspiratorial background relative to the militia movements that uh, Steve has studied so, uh, so long and so well, but I don't think it's happening within the sort of uh, auspices, certainly not under the auspices of the LDS, LDS tradition, which as I said is uh, worried about its 15 million people out, or 10 million people outside the United States, not about uh, the 15 people at, at the refuge. Um, uh, but I do want to say that the uh, militia, the Mormon marauders, the Mormon militia marauders, remind us uh, if we needed any reminding, giving sort of all the various kinds of uses of religious symbols, uh, text, uh, narratives, and so forth, and various other traditions, 
that uh, there is selective use of these particular narratives. Um, and there's a need for us as citizens, all of us to be, kind of become educated, become good public citizens and understand uh, some of these symbols, their meaning and, and the like, so that we can engage in public discourse as, as citizens. And as we do that, uh, we really have three sort of steps I would like to just close with and then invite your participation. Um, first is, and Hannah and actually everyone here has sort of talked about that, identify the areas of agreement, okay? And I think there's a lot, uh, notwithstanding that one party has claimed that they're representing the divine will in this discussion. <laughs> the second is to exercise what we in philosophy call the virtue of philosophical charity. That is to make sure that you represent the position to which you're opposed with fairness and with integrity. And then the third is to engage in what, uh, again, from a philosophical tradition, is called the virtue of intellectual humility. That we recognize that with, even within our own position, there are weaknesses, there are difficulties. Um, so charity towards our discussions, uh, discussion uh, uh, conversation partners, but also a sense of humility on, on our own. Well, thank you very much uh, for, for this. <laughs>